Our next speaker is, no, uh, is known as Curious Mark from the YouTube channel of the same name and specializes in restoring rare and notable vintage electronics. This talk will take us through the epic restoration of a genuine Apollo guidance computer. Please welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Mark Verdiel. All right, that was the most difficult part of the talk. Uh, so I'm Curious Mark, from, uh, I'm known as Curious Mark on the tubes, where we chronicle the restoration of uh, this awesome piece of hardware. Uh, we specialize in vintage electronics, and this is the uh, Apollo guidance computer, the revolutionary computer that guided man to the moon and back in the 1960s. Uh, that, that's a project that's uh, too big for one person, so there's, uh, it's a team of us, uh, Mike Stewart, uh, with who was our restoration lead, uh, Carl Clownsch, uh, Ken Sheriff, and myself, and we have a, a few sponsors that helped us along the way. Uh, so the <laughs> it's, it's chronicled in the glorious, I think we're at episode 30 now <laughs> on the tube, so I'll go fairly fast to try to give you an overview. Um, the computers of Apollo, how much digital uh, electronics are there on Apollo? Quite a lot, so there are four computers, uh, there's the LVDC made by IBM that uh, steered the Saturn V uh, to orbit. Then there are two of the Apollo guidance computers, two identical computers, one in the command module, one in the LEM. Uh, and I will go on to what they do. And then there is a fourth one it's called the AGS that's uh, made by TRW, and that's a very, very simple kind of... Um, uh, Altair <laughs> strength computer that will just pop you back in orbit if the uh, on the LEM if the uh, main computer fails. So what we're talking about is the uh, much more advanced uh, Apollo guidance computer. You'll see how advanced it is. Uh, so in in the command module, uh, it sits there on the wall. That's the piece in orange. And it has two displays. One is the uh, navigation disk key on top, and there's another one on the main panel, which is the main interface. And the other color boxes are actually boxes that we have in the lab and that we have now working. So we have a lot of the Apollo electronics working. Uh, in the LEM, it's uh, on the back wall uh, behind the astronauts. Remember that in a second, we'll go back. So that's what it looks like. Uh, the computer itself is this uh, big chunk of metal, which was really not big for the 1960s. Uh, but 70 pounds and 50 watts, which was at, at the time where computers were filling entire rooms. And then uh, what the computer, what the astronauts see of the computer is the disk key display keyboard interface, which is also was a re revolutionary thing to interact with your computer in real time. And uh, that, that phrase is from uh, Dan Leakley, uh, who was interviewing in, uh, at the Computer History Museum, where I also work. And uh, he was the, one of the programmers. He programmed the reentry. And the first question that he was asked is, what did the AGC do? And he thought to himself for a few seconds, and he said, the AGC did everything. And he was absolutely right. This is uh, the computer that does everything in the mission. It orients the spacecraft. It controls all the burns and guides to the various orbits. It's the digital autopilot. Uh, and then when you take it manually, you don't take it manually. It's a fly-by-wire. So it's always behind the scenes. Of course, it guides the LEM landing. So the LEM is a suicide burn. It was not considered flyable by a human. So still done today in the SpaceX uh, landings, they are suicide landing. They need computer assistance. And it also does the reentry because the reentry is guided, which is why the Americans could land within a few miles of their ships, where the uh, Soyuz is unguided, so it lands wherever it wants to land. <laughs> and uh, so th this guy is uh, Eldon Hall, is a principal engineer at MIT. So this computer was done in the MIT instrumentation lab, uh, today known as Draper's Lab. 
So it's an interesting one because it was done in a uh, um, pseudo, uh, it, it was an, at, at a university. Also, those people are gr great, great pedigrees. The Drapers, Charles Draper is the one that invented inertial navigations. And before, they had done the Polaris navigation, the Polaris being the ICBM uh, nuclear missile. So they were very, very well known. So remember that guy, Eldon Hall, come back later. Very advanced system. So it's complete opposite of what we do today. You know, today we take all stuff that's proven and then the electronics is usually uh, fairly old compared to uh, current electronics when, it, when you fly it in space. There it just was the equivalent of the arms race and it's just totally new stuff, never tested before. So it's the first time an aircraft, heck, a spacecraft, is entrusted to a computer. As I told before, it's very, very small. And the reason they could make it so small is that the f it's the first computer to use ICs, which was Eldon's personal decision and was a revolutionary decision at the time. And actually, that started the IC industry, this very one program, very one computer. It's an iterative computer uh, through the disky, which is something unusual for that time. It's also one that has a real-time OS that checkpoints, and if it crashes, it restarts uh, very instantly, which, is, which it did several times during the 1202s. And that's something that you know, Windows still doesn't do. <laughs> uh, and uh, designed by MIT, but built by Raytheon, wh which had, had built the I ICBMs before. So uh, how do you get your hands on <laughs> an AGC? Ours Come, came from the uh, this LEM, the LTA-8, which you can see today in Houston. So it's a LEM that flew, but it flew on Earth. LTA is, is a LEM test article, and that's the one where they, they use for man rating. Uh, how do you fly a LEM on Earth? Well, you put it in a huge vacuum chamber. Uh, it's a very serious thing. So they have this huge vacuum chamber. You can see LTA-8 in this chamber. They have another chamber where they have the command module. They uh, stuff uh, the astronauts in there, and they keep them in there. They fly uh, an entire mission. So the command module uh, astronauts stayed in there for 14 days, and the LEM people for three days. So it's fairly serious. If you develop a, a leak, you are you're in, anti uh, in complete vacuum. Uh, but our computer was in that LEM and one was used for the man rating of the LEM. Uh, so remember, I told you it was at the back. Well, conveniently, in Houston, they left the door open. So <laughs> you can peek through it, and it should be above that golden box, and there is no AGC in there. Uh, because it, even the museum, uh, one, uh, the, the one that flew, they, they took the first thing they took back from the uh, spacecraft was a guidance and navigation system. So ours was taken away, reused, um, and then eventually at the end of the program, it was like all uh, good government stuff, it was disposed at, at an auction. Right? And this is the bill of disposal, and you see the signature of Eldon, uh, the, the, the engineer, and the cost of acquisition, uh, $275,000, but of course that's just doesn't represent the cost of developing this thing, which was way, way, way bigger. So usually those were disposed of to whoever wanted to buy them, which was nobody but recyclers, and they get uh, melted or they disappear and you never see them again, except ours was saved by this man called Jimmy Locke. And he's actually, uh, he's actually a hacker. <laughs> he likes to build stuff with recycled electronics, so he visits the, his local recycler and he had worked you know, he's in Houston, so everybody got involved in that program. So for a few months, he was technician on the Apollo program. And on the shelf of the recyclers, he recognizes this old stuff as Apollo. So he's interested in it, all right? And the recycler doesn't want it. It's made of weird material. Some of it is radioactive. It's a pain in the butt. Uh, and uh, Jimmy Locke says, well, can I have it? And the recycler says yes, and he ends up uh, buying two tons of it. <laughs> and in there, he doesn't know, there is the AGC, uh, the AGC that will eventually restore. And he has been selling the stuff <laughs> since then. Right? That's a source of income for him. 
Um, so then uh, Mike Stewart, uh, young, and young space engineer, uh, was fascinated by Apollo, uh, enters the picture. So Mike's uh, interest, he likes to understand how everything works, of course, and, and is fascinated by the Apollo computer. Uh, and the, uh, there is a very good simulation uh, software for flight uh, called Orbiter. And it's, it's a really a physical simulation, extremely exact, and they want to fly back the Apollo mission. In order to do that, you can't fly it unless you have an exact model of the computer that runs the original software because it does so much of the stuff. And so the, he writes an emulator, but it turns out that writing it from the documents he has uh, from NASA doesn't work. And he gets convinced, so he, he can't run the program, he can never land on the moon. And he gets convinced that they'll never get to the bottom of it until they build a somewhat gate exact, or actually a gate exact replica of the computer. And so he goes and does that, and in order to do that, he has to retrieve the schematics, which he eventually gets from Eldon himself. He tracks all those people. So this, this is years of work before it gets there. Uh, and while he builds his uh, gate exact replica, he figures out there's still missing bits, and he needs to beep out a real one. And that's where he learns that Jimmy is going to exhibit is a GC because he wants to sell it, right? And the, it's going to reach a maximum point. It's uh, uh, you know, close to 2019, the uh, 50th anniversary of the landing. And so he asks Jimmy if he can beep out his computer, and Jimmy says, sure. <laughs> and so he beeps the computer, and uh, why is that it? Jimmy asks him, but do you think we could power it on? <laughs> To, to which is a little taken aback, uh, but you say, well, uh, I have not restored computers, but I know people who have, and we're fairly well known for restoring you know, vintage computers. We have done some uh, high-profile restorations, Xerox Alto, IBM 1401. So he contacts us, and of course, we enthusiastically say, yes, we want to restore this, of course. Um, and one problem is that Jimmy doesn't want to be separated from his computer. He doesn't want uh, us at his place, which is very modest. So we arranged to rent a room in a hotel for two weeks in Houston. And uh, then we put the uh, AGC, we bring our tools, and we don't let uh, the janitors come in for two weeks. <laughs> uh, and we set out to open it up and this is how I felt the first time I looked at it. <laughs> oh my God, this is, of course, it's a mythical computer for people that are in, in vintage computing. So uh, inside, two trays, uh, one logic tray, uh, and uh, no, mostly logic on the right, and here uh, it's the uh, mostly memory. And you see those beautiful modules uh, the, uh, the art of the same kind that Raytheon had made for the Polaris missile. Backplane is wire wrapped, uh, and it's, it's not hand wire wrapped. It's a three layer backplane. It's made by an, uh, an automated Garner Denver machine. And uh, wire wrapping is uh, considered more reliable than uh, soldered stuff at the time. It's, it's incredibly uh, reliable. It's also very beautiful. And also you can hack into it, which we'll do later. Uh, our unit is Ray 14, uh, which we have tracked down as being the one from uh, LTA 8. And it's part of the test engineering series. They have uh, uh, 15 of these. Ray stands for Raytheon, of course. Uh, and those are the computers I will go through hell, they'll bang on them, heat them up, and shock and vibe and everything. Uh, but they are otherwise identical from the production run that will follow, minus uh, one or two wires. However, they have something very different from the one that will fly, which is very advantageous to us. The modules are not potted, which means when you take them out, you can actually see the beautiful circuitry and even better, if there is a fault, we have a chance at repairing it. Uh, so you'll notice that this thing has, has ICs in it. And that was a very controversial decision. Um, 
Elden knew he was going to run into difficulties making it with individual transistors, and he was eagerly awaiting the first ICs to come out of the fab, and he has an order with Texas Instruments, one I think with Philco, and one with Fairchild. And Texas and Philco don't deliver. Fairchild gives him 35. He goes into the lab, tests them, they test good. So Fairchild, they will be the future Intel people, right? They know how to manufacture already. And he tests them, they are good, he writes a memo, we have to switch over to that. Um, there is no reliability data on it, but he says there is no reason why they shouldn't be as reliable as transistors, and that's the end of it, and they switch to this. And no, I was flabbergasted when I see that. This is 19, no, 1964, 1965, and you have surface-mounted parts, and the PCB is seven layers with blind vias, this is stuff that you will not see in for the rest of it until the 1990s. Right? Uh, also, this is all the same circuit. There's only one type of IC. It's a, a dual three input NOR gate. And they did that on purpose because they, they knew they had to bring up the entire industry. And actually, that's what actually happened. And we still live on the coattails of that. So they made it all the same circuit so they could have some decent volume. And uh, in the year, I can't remember, 1960-something, 80% of the IC output was for this program, for this computer. Um, so actually, there's two ICs in the um, computer. So there's the 2500 uh, uh, logic ICs, but there's a, a couple uh, analog ICs, also the uh, first, uh, uh, first analog ICs. And they're the sense amplifiers. They are uh, high sensitivity comparators. There at the bottom, you can see the TO can. If you ignore the red stuff, the red stuff is magnetics. So first analog, first digital IC. Oh, it's all potted, except two modules, which actually shouldn't be in that computer. So they have been put, uh, replaced, the, the original one have been replaced. So that's what the potted module look like. It's filled with this very, very tough black epoxy thing. They are both related to memory. One is the current switch module. Uh, by the way, memory, core memory, right? It's little ferrite cores and little wires. And the other one is the actual core memory itself, um, which is module B12 and holds four kilobytes of memory. And uh, this one is potted and uh, also, and what are the chances that all of our problems will be in potted modules? So we are very well prepared, thanks to Mike. Right? He has recovered all the schematics from the original designers. He made good on his promise to make a gate exact computer, and that's an FPGA gate exact representation, and we will find it to be 100% exact, even the, the little glitches that you see over there, we found them on the real one. And by the way, that helped him solve the problem of a software uh, emulated one. The software em emulated one now works, and they can fly the actual software and the mission in the simulation. But uh, now we're about to do it with uh, the real computer. By the way, that's the result of his beeping of the thing. He has this tool, which is actually accessible, where you can you know, uh, click on one pin, it will tell you the whole network. Um, so very, very, uh, we're very prepared, and Mike is. So we first get the modules and start to uh, test them gate by gate, and we find that all the gates work, which is totally abnormal for 50-year-old you know, hardware. They just have one module that doesn't work, is the clock divider, but they quickly repair it by shaking it. <laughs> and it was a known problem of these early units where there are little flakes of metal in the packages, and if you shook it, it would repair it. So pretty good. No, we, and we, we will test every module independently before we try the computer and we'll show that it was the, good, the right thing to do. Uh, the power supply uh, also checks good. It has caps, but th those are tantalums. They are absolutely perfect. And we power them back up. The, the, uh, the 15 volt supply, one comes back at 14.99 volts and the other one at 15.00, which is, totally abnormal, right? You, n you never see that happening. Uh, and we stress test them, they are all good. Uh, ah, we have one piece of bad news. We have a problem with the erasable memory module, the one that's spotted. 
Um, and if you know how core memory modules work, they are little arrays, uh, they, are, they, have, they have wires going X and Y and some that sneak through and little cores and we have one of the sneak through wires uh, the inhibit for bit 15 that's an open. So because you, you can test it just by continuity, it's not that hard. And that's pretty bad. It means we could read it once, and then since reading memory is destructive in core memory, we'll lose the bit to rewrite it. We need inhibit bit 15, and we'll lose all of our bit 15, so it won't run. We have no RAM. Uh, ROM, we don't have it either. So the, the, the ROM in the Apollo guidance computer is made with core rope memory, which is a variation of ferrite memory, where the bits are hard woven in the wires. If the wires goes around the core, it's a zero. If it goes in a core, it's a one. Uh, of course, that's very impractical to develop software. So what did they have when they do development, which this machine was used after the flight, it, uh, that's what it was doing. They have an emulator where it, 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 it gets the software from a mainframe computer and then feeds the analog signal that makes the computer think it has rope attached and you can modify your software. Uh, there's, this is made by Raytheon. There's no documentation on it at all. And uh, we have Ken's with our reverse engineer extraordinaire. He has reverse engineered the, 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 no, the 8086, 34,000 transistor by the transistor. So should be piece of, a piece of cake for him. And it's, he starts working in our hotel suite and are the hieroglyphics of the master, uh, mostly done by hand. Uh, but then we, we convince ourselves, okay, we have no ROM, no RAM, uh, but we should be able to pair it up and see if it at least starts to boot. Uh, knowing that the parse values are good, all the modules we tested are good. Uh, so we're fairly confident that that should work. So I, ho I had brought my logic analyzer, we hook it up to the machine, we turn it on and to our surprise, you see right away, so I was hooked up on the, so this is an instruction cycle and it has 12 steps in it. The, and it's doing the 12 micro instruction step. And then if you we looked at the trace, it is actually trying to boot at the address it should. It fetches some, some garbage from the memory which comes as a jump, it jumps, it hangs, the watchdog catches it because this has a watchdog in it, several of them actually, and it starts to reboot again. And we are like, what? We didn't expect that either. It wants to boot. So very quickly, Mike, again, <laughs> he has brought one of his FPGA board, the same one that he used to make the, the GateExact replica, and he whips up some memory emulation and we wire it in. And that takes a day or two. And then after a little bit of fiddling, we have, uh, we can feed it some programs, like we feed it Apollo 11, uh, LEM software, and it runs through 100 instructions. And we are flabbergasted, we didn't expect that either. Right? So a lot of things have to work right for it, running 100 instructions. So that's the Motley crew, that's after two weeks of work, you know, 7 a.m. to midnight, uh, and we achieved a lot more than we thought we would. So we all go back to California. Uh, I get the module uh, and uh, I uh, work for a connector company, Samtech, that has a good X-ray. And we put the module in the X-ray at Samtech. Uh, the hope is that if we have a break of the wire, it's going to be near one of the pins. Uh, they had seen such failures before. Uh, and if it's near, of the, uh, near one of the pins, maybe we can drill into it and reattach it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we see these big pictures and you see all the wires and all the cores but there is no break that we can see. And actually we do, um, uh, um, how do you call that? A TDR, uh, with TDR on it, so you, 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 send, uh, uh, you send a pulse down the wire and if it's broken, there's a reflection, it comes back and you can see the start to diverge. And it tells us the length where the break is. It's right in the middle of the module we do a similar experiment using my RF equipment. If there's a broken wire should act as an antenna, you can see what the resonance is. Tells us it's right in the middle of the module. We are done, we can't repair this thing. We have to do a work around it. Uh, Carl gets busy, he's our, 
these are props extraordinaire, so he makes uh, a replica disk key. Uh, we couldn't use any of the commercial ones because we have to hook up to a real disk key, not to a modern computer. Uh, and then a problem that we have all the time with all hardware is the connectors. Uh, this is made with a weird connector system, Malco, uh, Malco pins, they're, they're called Malco Mini Wasp. Um, fortunately, we have the drawing for the pins and I work for a connector company, so. <laughs> I don't have to use much of my CTO powers to convince the company to retool. Uh, they made a, a, a batch of uh, 2,500 Malco pins with soft tooling. Uh, still cost them a pretty penny. I think it was $25,000 because those are um, progressive die uh, manufacturing, which is quite expensive. Nobody does that anymore. Uh, so that's actually the test connector because we need to test it. And how do you test it? Well, uh, they had this test monitor. The AGC is actually a blinking light machine. Uh, and those are the blinking lights. And this is actually quite powerful. You can inspect all the registers, but you can also step it. Uh, you can do breakpoints, uh, all kind of goodness. Uh, and of course, Mike's there again with an FPGA, and he reduces the thing to this thing, which plugs to the Samtech connector, which plugs into the machine which means now we can, so here you actually have a prototype of it, so, so it's prototype test monitor on the, on the FPGA AGC, and he has a, a fake disk key and the fake blinking lights, and he gains access to an entire machine. So after a lot of back and forth, we finally convince um, Jimmy to let us have the uh, computer in California still can't be separated from it. So we have to fly him with the computer <laughs> and he can't be separated from his wife either. So we have the wife coming too. And then the airline manages to lose it. <laughs> Which is kind of terrible because at this point we have uh, the Wall Street Journal filming us and the computer is nowhere to be there. But he came the next flight, we have it. And now we can properly work on it, uh, add the wire that we were missing to make it a fly computer. Uh, and this is the you know, simple setup with the power supply and the simplest we can do, right? Power supply, test monitor, and uh, we can pair that that way. Uh, but we have no RAM, no ROM. So what we want to do is get those, those uh, uh, core rope modules to work. And those are ground support equipment. They are behaving like normal 50 years old electronics. They're still made by Raytheon, right? High quality stuff, same components, but they have not been subject to the rigor of space testing, right? So nothing works basically. Um, so they are made with this quick prototyping technique called dipsticks and which where you put your ICs and you put them upside down in the receptacle. We have all kind of bad contacts. Transistors are dying like normal 50 year old transistors. Uh, there are some disconnected wires, but there are also some missing ones, so which we think should be there and are not. Uh, and then, so we fix all that and we try it, but it still does not work. And we think the hardware is restored to what it should have been. And eventually uh, we discover we have timing pro uh, problems. I have to solder those two capacitors of the right color and uh, to make it work so Eventually, we made it work, so Ken is feeding software to the ROM and Mike can read it, uh, but the box was unfinished in his design or we caught it between two design revision. We had to modify it to make it work. Anyhow, what we have, uh, we do have ROM. So now we need RAM, so we, we go and test the other RAM modules that we had. And here's our second potted one. And uh, oops, it has a problem with it. So same thing, every module we test before we put it back in the machine. And uh, this is the module that drives the current in the core op memory, uh, in the ferrite core memory. This requires a lot of support and a lot of high current pulses. And uh, Mike suspect there is a bad diode in it, and we try a few methods to open it up, but we can't. So in the middle, it goes. Uh, fortunately, we know exactly how those modules are made. They are the drawings with every wire. So we mill it until we see the top of the wires, and then we take dental tools, and I know exactly where the wires are. So I can do it very carefully. This stuff is ultra tough, um, but I know into what I am digging. 
So after a day of work, there you go, you get all the wires. The wires are also not soldered, they are nickel wires that are welded, so it's a lot tougher than soldering. And we confirm, indeed, we have a uh, bad diode, and um, the construction of the analog module is cordwood, so the, the components are orthogonal to the surface, they go through a block of aluminum, so we can just drill the diode out, and uh, it's an 1N914. <laughs> So we, for lunch, we go to Anchor Electronics, the guys that live in the valley, our, our, our old surplus store, and do you have one N914? Yes, we have them from the 1960s, and they are $1.10 each. They haven't updated their pricing either. So <laughs> <laughs> By the way, those diodes that we have in those modules is not a surprise. They were known to be bad. They are Mesa diodes. They age badly, and the, the, the guy who was producing them got kicked out of the program, so they never flew those. And we replace the diode, and it works. How, how do we know th uh, uh, they work? This is a um, this is a magnetic logic. It, it works with also with uh, cores, but big ones, permalloy cores, and uh, it generates pulse by flipping the magnet, uh, the, the magnetic orientation of the core. And you can see if you look at the purple trace, you can see the core flipping one way, and the core flipping the other way. And we know the module works. Ta-da, so we re re rejoice for an error until Mike continues to test the module and finds another fault and it's pointing at where it thinks it is and it's a way more annoying fault. It's a short. So he has a short, you see how the core is represented. The core has little uh, windings around it to uh, switch it from one, no, it's a bistable core. So one polarization to the other and to pick the signals up. And apparently there is some bad stuff in there. So it goes back in the middle. I open my fourth and fifth pocket in it. And yep, there's a short exactly where Mike thought it would be. And uh, indeed, it's in that core module. And so the core is a potted component inside a potted assembly. And uh, here it shows with only a few turns, but it has hundreds of turns in it in reality. So we are like, oh dang, we are done here. So Mike goes in the side of the lab and he has actually some of those cores and starts seeing if he can you know, put a hundred turns of wires. In the meantime, uh, I look at the schematics and you can see where the, the short is. So you see the, f the four big coils and there's something that ties the two coils together so I can save one of the cores if I disconnect the one on the right. That's uh, where I put my double strike on the wire. Uh, but then I'm missing one signal for that second transistor. Then I say, well, but maybe I can take it by taking it from the other coil and putting a little transformer, inverting it. And then we have a aha moment. Say, wait, 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 wait. It's just to provide an inverted signal uh, from the first transistor to the second transistor. We could do it with a PNP transistor. Aha, uh -huh. so here's the hacking plan. You go clip, clip, solder, 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 and you put a PNP transistor in there, it should work again. And this is our hacked module that has sprouted a new transistor. <laughs> Will it work? Yes, it does. So you can see the, uh, the trace, and you can also see that our transistor is, so that's the PNP, that's the second one, is, is very fast, so it gives, uh, it, it's much better than the original one, so we have a little spike, but it shouldn't be a problem in the actual circuit. Um, so there we cleaned it up. So the thing is that we had to come up with a repair that would fit in the original module. There's no space between the modules. So it, it's, I think it's a nice hack. It, it, it looks like it fits. Uh, okay, so we're, we have our driver module repaired. Now we have to go work around our RAM problem. So it turns out this computer is, uh, the, the RAM is 16 bits. So the computer is actually a 15 bit machine plus one bit for parity. So what do you do while well, we replace the missing data bit? So we, we will hijack the parity bit uh, by uh, rewiring the backplane and replace it with our dead bit. And then we'll uh, also hijack the parity checking thing, we'll disable it. And this way we run without parity checking, but it should run. And it's actually 
I can't remember six wires that I had to redo, and it's, it's, a, it's a back plane that's wire wrapped. So you unwrap them carefully, and you put your new wires, and you're all set and done. And okay, so now we have <laughs> my hacked module with this. So he has three pockets this way, three pockets the other way, ready to go back in. And uh, so by that time, we have press. This is the Wall Street Journal filming. And we're about to turn it on. And will it run? Uh, no. Let's see if we have the sound. No, we have no sound. I'll do the sound. Mike, make it run. So you'll show it on the okay, disk. Uh, watch current. One, seven, four. Okay, here it goes. Two point uh, two seven. Oh, it's yeah. running. Yeah, we got oh, it. Like oh, on, on its on its own memory. Yeah, on its own memory. That's great. So yeah. 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 So that's after nine months of effort, and of course we are trying to, we have our own deadline, it's not before the decade is out, but before the 15th anniversary, we have a few days left before we can present the computer. Uh, before we do that, so really quick thing, what, what you do when you have a, an Apollo computer that works, first thing, we save the, con the content of the memory, which, which we did before we did the, the, f the, the bit flipping thing, because we had one chance of reading it completely which we did, and it told us, no, it has an IMU in it, so it told us exactly where it was when it was turned off. It was in the, mus uh, the, the, the middle of the Houston uh, Johnson Space Center, and we know what, which program it was running. Uh, also, the first thing we do is now we have a running AGC. We go see its brethren, and this one is at the Computer History Museum where I work, and volunteer, and uh, it has its core rope modules which we had been looking at with envy <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> and after a uh, little bit of negotiation, they asked us, uh, if, uh, we, we, uh, we asked them, they, they let us remove it, and it is at the core module. And we just take them out, plug them in our working computer, which we have schlepped there, and uh, we read it. And Mike is able not only to recover the software, but he runs it right there in front of the super nervous curators, which were wondering if we were going to kill their modules, but no. And so that lands us in the local newspaper, but also in Wall Street Journal in the edition on the anniversary date um, of the uh, landing. They had a, a centerfold uh, that tell the story. Oh. So what do you do when you have a working uh, AGC? Well, you play with it, and they have an excellent game written for it. It's called Moon Landing. <laughs> and so now the circle is complete, because what Mike wanted to do is have the exact replica uh, of the, you know, being able to run the software and fly. And this is, this is Orbiter with an ASSP but we have ripped the software emulation and we are running the calculation on the AGC. So the AGC, it needs to be connected to the uh, IMU, right? And the, the, it's, it's the form uh, uh, tight system. The IMU is the um, um, inertial platform, right? With the gyros and the accelerometer. If it, if it does not connect it to that and if it doesn't sense acceleration when it fires uh, or, or the, the rocket, it, it, it gets all uppity, but we can, we can have uh, we can simulate all that with Orbiter, and now it's and after a, f a few weeks of work, it's happy. So we are ready to take it on the road and demonstrate landings with it. We can actually land with this thing, which is hard, by the way. <laughs> it's it, it, you, you realize, you no, know, when uh, Armstrong said, you know, yeah, going to orbit around the moon, it's a three landing, it's an eleven. He is not kidding. The number of times we crash with the thing because we forgot one switch, it, it's really hard. Remember Eldon Hall? He is in Florida and he sees his computer run uh, and he gave us actually a few more rope modules that he has stashed away, <laughs> which we read. Uh, so I mean, all that stuff would be impossible without the engineer having stashed away the stuff, right? Um, and uh, unfortunately, he passed away, uh, f uh, uh, I think, two years after this at the age of 98. But he got to see his computer working again. And we went and made demonstrations. So it, 
it's fairly involved. Now, it, now the whole thing is fully connected, so it gets all the signal that it expects. And uh, we actually ran it at the MIT Museum in front of the uh, original developers of it, originally, uh, which came to us. And this is Don Ives, that's the guy that programmed the moon landing. And say, oh, by the way, I have a few more rope modules. <laughs> Turns out he also had another AGC that he hadn't told us about. <laughs> but eventually, um, our AGC sells uh, for a record price, of which is three times the price of the previous AGC, which was Don Isle's AGC that had sold uh, a, a month or two before, uh, which was the whole, uh, the whole point of, 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 of the restoration for Jimmy, right? He wanted to sell it and extract as much money as he could. He is a man of very, very uh, modest means. So this, is, this was his retirement, basically. Um, so we are kind of uh, sad to let it go. And actually, I, I fully expected that whomever bought it, we also sold it with the replica that Carl made. Uh, so somebody could run it. But you can't run it if you don't have, if you don't have the, the core rope emulator and all that stuff. So I expected the phone to ring. And it never rang. So we don't know where it went. Uh, well, we, we still have the, um, the FPGA version, but the problem is that the FPGA version is that you can't read ropes. And there's still some that pop up now and then. Well, here's Mike with another FPGA circuit. And this is a peripheral you all wanted, a USB reader for <laughs> core rope memory. <laughs> you just plug your core rope memory module and you read it in your computer. I'm sure you, you, everybody w needs one of those. This is, by the way, core op memory inside. So this is the, the latest video for those who follow the channel, and it's incredibly complicated. So uh, the, the cores are hard to see, but you see the wires, and here are the ladies wiring the ones and the zeros. And once you're done, it's this. And that, that, that's the landing program. Right? That's how we landed on the moon. And that's Mike trying to explain it, and it's really, really hard. <laughs> the video is an hour long, <laughs> and blah, blah, some more tools. And um, so now he has a core rope reader. We find some more. This is at Steve Jervetson, local collector. He's the VC behind SpaceX. Has an incredible collection of stuff, and he just literally wants us to take it. And we say, no, 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 we have too much already. We don't have time for this one. We go, <laughs> but look at that baby. This is a complete uh, GNC system, guidance and navigation. So it's completed as the IMU, that's the big ball over there. It has all the interface to it. Uh, and that one is uh, from the uh, last thing that was done with the AGC, the fly-by-wire program. So they had flown by wire a spacecraft, which is rather easy because it behaves without any friction. It's perfect, fly ellipses, piece of cake. Then they try, let's do it with an airplane, which is much more difficult, and that was the F-8. And you see the pallet on the top that we're about to open. And it has a disk key on the side, right in the middle of the picture. So <laughs> there's a plane hanging with a disk key on the side. And sure enough, we dig into it, and we find the AGC, and we, fi we find its ropes. And not too surprisingly, it's not the digital fly-by-wire by ropes, which are probably uh, were considered secret at the time. Uh, so we, but we got the Apollo 14 LEM test software, which uh, which we didn't have before. Uh, recovered ropes. Uh, so, so this is uh, still a continuing story. Uh, uh, more episodes coming. So this is what. Uh, we have done so far. Uh, we have a fairly complete library of stuff, and, and modules keep coming. You'd think uh, they, they will be all lost, but no, they, they are around. Uh, an interesting one is that in one of the episodes, I go visit that ship, which is in Oakland, near where I live, and there is the AS202, uh, this is the, f uh, the, first, um, the first command module that they flew with an AGC in it. It was a suborbital flight, block one, and Mike recovers the rope, and it's, this thing is autonomous. There were, there were no, no far before they put people in there, which on, would only happen on, on uh, uh, Apollo 7. And so the thing flies itself, and so he recovers it, 
puts it in orbiter, flies it, and say, well, this is really weird. It, it, so it, it does the suborbital mission, and then it, it, f it does those, towards the end, those three, no, three times three second burns. That's really weird. And I was able to dig out some of the old stuff, and you can see the, how the mission is planned, and indeed it does the three, three times three second burns at the end, so we got the exact thing. It's, it's really incredible. You can see it do the whole mission. And the, uh, in, the, uh, in the simulation, it, it lands at the right place, uh, but in reality, it did not. Because <laughs> they didn't have quite the, the, the right coefficient of drag and whatever for the capsule the first time they did it. So there's still ongoing work. Our next big step is to get to a CDU. So that's the full GNC system, by the way. So the AGC is over there. You see the disk key, you see the IMU. Uh, but there's a big box, which is important to us, it's called the CDU. And that's uh, basically the, uh, the DAC and the ADC, five channel, uh, 20 bits, I think. Uh, and of course, at the time, it takes a whole box that's very complicated. And it's important to us because that's where the 1202 originated. And it turns out that uh, we know from running the uh, actual AGC that the 1202 has not been reported correctly. Uh, but we need to prove it, so we need to get a CDU. We have one. So that's going to come in future episodes and still keeps us busy. In, in the meantime, Steve gave us the whole Apollo communication system, which is another 20 episodes of stuff. And I'll stop right there. <laughs> it's the end of my 100 slides. <laughs> So at this point, I'll take some questions. I don't know how much time I have. They'll probably kick me off the stage if I take too long. Yes? Um, what oh, this is way pre... Uh, so what the question was, what digital technology do the ICs use? Those are the first ICs. They are RTL, resistors and transistor. Um, the, 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 the first, the absolute first generation of ICs. Other questions? No. Yeah, either I was too clear or I lost everybody <laughs> over there. Hey, we have an uh, RTL system for <laughs> no, <laughs> So, yeah, that's how my, my chat. So, the question was do I have any R2 units with me today? That's how my channel started building an R2D2 unit. So, you have to be a, a, f a full nerd, you cannot be a halfway nerd. <laughs> <laughs> question? Yeah, I actually talked to the engineer that did it because we got some somehow we got co-opted in the Draper Lab people, and we got a uh, celebration dinner with them, and we had uh, an incredible story of those people, uh, you know, unsung engineers uh, that uh, told me how they laminated it and did it, and then he was trying to peddle it after the program to other people, and nobody wanted of it because of course it's way too expensive. Same, same for the disk key, right? We have one, we actually got a real disk key screen, we relighted it, and it's this incredible high resolution, high contrast, you know, low power consumption screen that looks like a cell phone screen. And Sylvania was trying their ads for it, where so we have this new technology and there's a picture of the disk key. Right? And they were trying to peddle that, but nobody wanted to buy a screen for you know, $10,000, right? <laughs> but electroluminescent made it in cars eventually, but still not uh, in, in, in that format. Any other questions? Back there. Uh, on the top of my head, so he was asking the specs for the computer. Uh, top of my head uh, is five megahertz, um, um, fi 15 bits, so which is what they needed to, uh, they, they, they back calculated it from the precision they had, and it has no floating point native. So uh, Dan Lickley um, joked that, you know, they had to scale everything to fit into 15 bits and say, well, if, if we, um, Miss the moon, we are going to be half the way there or twice as far <laughs> <laughs> because of a scaling issue. Uh, four kilobytes of RAM, 72 kilobytes of ROM. That shows you how much denser the ROM was by using this uh, uh, 
um, rope stuff, very, very strong in I.O. Um, 250 channels of I.O. because it, it has a wire attached to everything in the spacecraft, right? Uh, what else? And that, that, that's basically it. And then, of course, you cannot take it in isolation. You have, it's part of the, of the guidance and navigation system. So you have the IMU, it has this, uh, this digital analog conversion system. Um, so it's, can you fly to the moon on an Arduino? No, it, it, it's, w no, calculation-wise, not strong, right? It's the equivalent of a 6502, just about. But IO-wise, uh, 39, um, registers for immediate access to, to update the all the analog channels, uh, timers, it has, it has way more than you'd think uh, where it counts. Right. Over there. Uh, 14 volts. So, so you, 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 well the power supply. You, you, come in, it, you come in with 28 volts and it generates 14 and 4 volts and it's uh, redundant. Question back there? So question is, is that it trips people, that this thing that was so precious was considered garbage, right? And also it trips people that uh, collectors have access to them and it should be locked up in the museum. Uh, you have to put it in context. So most of the stuff has been saved. We, we live on the, on, the, on the coattails of this, right? And all the engineers were fired and after the program, very shortly after the Apollo 11 landing, by the way. Right, they had to call them back on Apollo 13 because they were all gone. Uh, so it, it disseminated and uh, it made Silicon Valley as we know it today. It made the space industry as we know it today. Uh, so no loss of knowledge uh, or nothing. But this is an enormous program. They have too much of it. By the end of it, this thing is completely obsolete. Right. So they took bullets at first because this was going too far ahead using ICs, and by the end of the program, it was so far behind because they were TTL ICs, right? What are they doing with that old stuff? And you have to, Im uh, to imagine that this is uh, disposed in 1975. They are already engineering the shuttle. Uh, and then you have gone from you know, balloons to uh, gliders to planes to uh, you know, jet planes to rockets to the moon in no space of a few years or a few tens of years. Well, next is Mars, right? And uh, so they do what you do with government property. You just can't give it to anybody. Although some of the engineers took it with them, because they knew it was important to them. They did the right thing. But normally you're not supposed to do that. You auction it off. It's how it works. You either destroy it if it's uh, if it's secret, or you auction it off. And whoever wants to pay for it gets it. And nobody wanted to pay for that stuff, right? And that's how it gets in the hands. Of course, the one that flew, that was either recuperated or it's in museum. And the reason we have access to those is because it's not in museum. So, so pray those guys. Uh, this is how art collections are made too, right? They are not made by museum. They are made by private collectors. And eventually they pass away and they donate it. So ours will eventually go to a museum. But uh, you know, praise those guys who saved it and kept it with them, lugging it around for years <laughs> and gave it to us because we, we asked the Smithsonian and they, they gave us the middle finger basically. You can't touch it. Right? <laughs> All right, that's it. one more over there. Yeah, yeah, there was, there was lots, lots of hesitation. It turns out we thought, so question, was there any hesitation in grinding into the stuff? Yeah, we tried everything we could. It turns out without knowing it, we did what they did at the time. So that's how they repaired the module. They went in there and there was a lady who dug with dental tools and her name was Mary. And in the CDU that we bought, we found one of those modules with where Mary made a hole in it. The, 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 the parts were so precious that so few of them they would reuse everything. I think I'm out of time. I'm getting a. Uh, 
Last question. The uh, question is if I, work at the, if I work at the Computer History Museum. Yes, I do work at the Computer History Museum. Yeah, come to the Computer History Museum. You'll see an AGC from which we have run the, uh, no, read the rope, but there's also an IBM uh, 1401 that works, all kind of incredible stuff. Okay, on this, thank you very much. Uh, and.